It's uh, similar to what you'd say, like a points over turnover, points off of turnovers, points off of turnovers, or turnovers, errors, and, you offensive know, rebounds, runs errors. like what happened. Yep. I mean, mm-hmm. segues perfectly into this women's national championship because yeah. if you watch that fourth quarter, the first quarter, the fourth quarter, the first quarter, okay, UConn couldn't buy a rebound, nothing. And it- yeah, and it's, it's amazing how that just kind of, I don't want to say that that's how it occurs, but like, you know, when you, when you go, when you get that far and it just doesn't, it just doesn't go for you so early. It's just like so deflating. Well, there are two, you, things right? going, two things going against them, right? Then, I mean, South Carolina had size. Right. And they were just, you know, grabbing them, cleaning up the boards and getting second chances. And they opened up the big lead. Now, Buckers, on the other end, was trying to carry the team on her back. And, I mean, a couple of times she passed the ball and would never get back to her. And this is a point being made by the uh, the announcers. And then he said, you know, she said, hell with this. I'm taking this myself. And she comes up with three straight shots on her own. And so they were working their way back in. And you thought that things were starting to turn. And they did. They, they got close. But then South Carolina just shut the door. The amazing thing here is that, well, first of all, UConn got to where they did with, uh, you know, basically a donut in, in their lineup because uh, they they don't have the the front court size that South Carolina does. I mean, South Carolina was the better team. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I think you you kind of felt like um, did you know with Gino or Am and and UConn, do they have the the puncher's chance to uh, to pull off they the uh, did. upset here, yeah. Um, you know, and good for South Carolina. It's like you know, super exciting for them. Yeah, Dwan uh, Staley gets her second championship. Yeah, no, how about that? And I think what's even better now for this as well too is you start to see the distance. Um, of UConn's dominance, even though they're still obviously a, a, a spectacular program. You know what's now happening? You're to Go ahead. Other teams are catching up. Other teams exactly. Up, right? That yeah. is look. Look at the state of the game. And Rebecca Lobo was on the broadcast. Okay, she was one of the first superstars to come out of UConn. Mm-hmm. And how long ago was that? Twenty five yeah. years ago. I hate to say yes to that, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She's in her forties, you know. Right? Yeah, I know. Yeah, and she's long retired from the WNBA. Yes, Dawn Staley herself. You know, she's from that era, but and now they're all becoming coaches, and now they're they're advancing the program. But if you just compare, and we used to talk about this all the time, Jeff Bernstein and I, because we used to do a lot of the, uh, Jeff, of course, did all the women's games. I used to you know jump in uh, that the level of play in women's basketball from 20 years ago versus today, 20 years ago, you had your Yukons and you had your Tennessees and you had your Louisiana techs, whatever. And then huge drop off. So these teams would always wind up in the final four be the same four teams every year. And it kind of was like the state of men's lacrosse 30 years ago. Okay. Right. You had your superpower teams and you had your, you know, amateurs, but, uh, you know, basically, you know, glorified club teams. But that's what the women's team, and to this day, you see which which uh, schools are serious about their women's programs. You know, so... I mean, even in the American you, East, you have constant bottom feeders like New Hampshire. Do you think um, UConn's run, and I'm not saying it's come to an end, but Gino Ariam has run there, um... Is that going to be looked at as like like John Wooden's thing? Like that's never going to happen again. Gene, Gino the, Auriemma cr- is the John Wooden of women's basketball. There's no because, doubt the parity, because of the parity now in, in women's basketball, UConn is now they, – they, they're kind of cemented that UCLA legacy from – from the um, 60s and 70s, I guess. but They used to call then, the NCAA tournament the UCLA Invitational. Eh, because, yeah. you know, who's going to go up against UCLA in the national championship game and how bad are they going to lose? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a... Um, 
it's it's, it's an interesting view, and it's, it's 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 really interesting to watch the 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 changing of the guard here. I remember UConn? Right, as, as how many? Uh, they've had more than one undefeated season, haven't they? Sure. How many in a row did they have? Right, I, I felt like they were going after UCLA's. Um, didn't they game? Didn't they break? Yeah, did they they chased I it. They, I think they broke it. Didn't yeah, they? I they? Yeah, I thought they broke the. Uh, okay, the, I'm looking the for that wins record, or well, consecutive wins record, right? Yeah, consecutive wins record, because yeah, they went thirty five and zero in ninety four ninety five, which basically is Rebecca Lobo era. Okay. Mm-hmm. They went thirty nine and zero in two and oh one oh two. Uh they went thirty nine and oh in oh eight oh nine and oh nine ten. This is what we're talking about here. Okay. Forty and oh in twenty thirteen, fourteen, thirty eight and oh in twenty fifteen, sixteen. Nah. <laughs> but this is what I'm talking about, how one sided, if you could put together a dominant program, you could own the sport the way they did. I mean, just uh, this is Oriema year by year. I, I mean, absolutely crazy. And of course, Final Fours. Okay, when are they the only time they make a final first Final Four they failed to make. They last Final Four I should say correct myself. Last Final Four they failed to make was oh six oh seven. And of course, you don't count uh, twenty twenty because the tournament was canceled. They made it this year. They made it last year. They made it every year from oh six oh seven on. That's yeah. beyond UCLA. Yeah. That's how many championships? He's got thirteen? No, he's got twelve. Had he won today, would have been thirteen. Thirteen, right. He's got twelve. He's got now. Yeah. But here's where the parody comes into play. South Carolina this year, Stanford. Oh no, last correct. Year. He's got eleven. He's got eleven. Okay, we were a little bit ahead of ourselves. But anyway, he, still he, a he, lot. he still got he still got he still got one more in his bag, though. At least I think because they're still a very good program. Yeah. Right. But but like we were talking about, they had won two, three. They had won a bunch in a row, and then South Carolina, Notre Dame, Baylor. It's canceled. Stanford, South Carolina. I mean, so now you've gone. He's gone longer than he wants to go without a national championship. We'll put it that way. Yeah, it, it's almost too long. I mean, yeah, he's it, he has not won it since uh, fifteen sixteen, and Does Haley he, has won two since. <laughs> yes, she's won two. So she's almost taking over that. Yeah, it's almost like, like Yankees, yeah, the Red Sox. Yankees yeah, less won in oh nine, but the Red Sox have won three. Yes, uh, a little bit of changing of the guard here for the uh, the coaches thing. Um, do you think that he could say to himself today, I did a really good coaching job with the team this year, even without winning, they were a better team? I will bet you coach. that's exactly what he's saying right now as we speak in the in the press conference, or, you know, he's, or that's what he said right after the game. I guarantee you that's what he said, that you know this team wasn't necessarily as dominant as some of the teams he's had in the past, and South Carolina definitely exposed that. But it took a South Carolina to do that. The one thing I will say, be that, and this is with all sports right now, with that COVID extra year that the players have been getting, uh, how different that can be for a team. Because I think you've, you, you've also, we've all seen teams where you look at a team and you say, oh, if that kid was still there, they'd be so good this year. Um, there would be nobody that could stop them. And... You know, they you know just doesn't match up. They just can't get the players together at the same time. Now it gives you this extra opportunity to get those players together at the same time. So I think you can see one or two more years um, of some teams being I mean, shockingly good because they were able to keep some players together that, that they didn't think they would be able to. Well, especially in the non-marquee sports because, you know, still, you know, some guys like uh... – Champagne on the uh, on St. John's. He's going into the draft after his junior year. Right. Okay, yes. that, that's another headline from this week. But uh, you see, you see it definitely in you know sports like women's basketball, sports like lacrosse, both men's and women's. Where unless you're in the Ivy League, of course. But uh, the the extra year that that people get. First of all, yeah, another year to play together. 
Another year to take care of unfinished business if you felt you felt short uh, the pre- uh, a previous year. And, yeah, uh, and you get the more time a team plays together, obviously the better it, the more it develops, the better it gets. So an extra year out of these players is definitely great. That's why they have red shirting to begin with. Yeah. But in this case, uh, COVID gave everybody a red shirt. Yeah, and you know it's actually, and if you have a program, I guess like UNLV's program, right, where yeah. where you you don't uh, you you're not looking for one and done, you're looking to keep guys for multiple years, and you get an extra year out of guy, you got like Con Gillespie, right? Yeah, you see have a player like that who's able to play a little more. I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Hey, and they'll get to a final four without him. Oh yeah, absolutely. But segue to the men. Okay, yeah. Villanova, well, one of the reasons why Villanova did not get to the national championship game is because uh, more blue eyes Achilles. Yeah. And, uh, we talked about this last that. week. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. That, was, that was a deal breaker because I, now, of course, some people believe that Kansas played so well it wouldn't have mattered. But I think the game would have been closer at the very least. Yeah, I think that the pressure early on from – from Kansas, if you had another player that could kind of take some of it off of the uh, of Gillespie's shoulders, I think a little bit. Sure, um, I felt like he didn't have a great game early on in particular, but it was similar to tonight's game as well. Do you saying that the first quarter, you know, for the for South Carolina kind of dominated, changed the pace of the play? It did for Kansas as well too. Kansas got the big lead; they got it up to as high as nineteen at one point in time, and, sat and on it. yeah, they really did. Um, I thought uh, Bill Self did a nice job of any time there was a little bit of a run that they got to, you know, 10 or 11 points, timeout, tried to slow it up there. So I think he did a nice job with his timeouts. And they could get as close as six UNLV. And then they, they just couldn't make a shot that they needed to make or they they, they turned the ball over or they just mm-hmm. couldn't get past that that – you know, down by six mark. There was one point in time about now I want to say Villanova. five, six minutes. Yeah, five or six minutes left in the game where they took an ill advised three pointer when they were down by uh when they were down by six. And I was thinking to myself, you know, that would have been a time to get yourself down by four. And that really changed the game. Well that's yeah, it plays back to that. Last week I mentioned it too, but uh because sixty minutes had Sue Bird on between games. And uh, Sue Bird basically said, and again, you see a lot of this much more in the women's game than in the men's. The women will take mid-range jump shots. Right. They will not step back behind the line. If they have the shot there, that's where they'll take it. Two or three doesn't matter. You take the shot, you hit the shot. Yeah, wherever you're open, you're going to take that shot. Yeah. I mean that's so, great. I li- I love seeing that because it, it's definitely something that's lost because of the three point line. Because everybody, I mean, they want to get the extra point, and of course, you know, some people say, say everybody wants to be Steph Curry, but it counts for more. Okay, and if you if it's more, if it's makeable, you're gonna step back. But the sure shot is, you know, maybe the 15 footer, maybe from the free throw line, maybe, maybe from, you know, the uh, 17 footer just ahead of the arc, whatever it is that, you know, you go for the shot, you're the best shot period. And that I think gets kind of lost because of the three point line. But in the women's game, maybe thanks in part to Sue Bird, who says I've made a career out of mid range jump shots. I don't necessarily go for the three all the time. That's a different philosophy. Right, yeah. Very different. So just back to, uh, you know, watching. I just felt like they got jumped on early by Kansas. They didn't have enough to – they didn't have enough players to, to really get themselves back. I think if Moore is playing, I think it's a different game because you can get them – instead of being down by six, you, you maybe you can cut it to two. Yeah, you know, with with a couple minutes left, it's just another option. It's another person you can go. But you know, they're not they're not playing a ton of guys to begin with. If you're a good free a three point shooting team like Villanova is, mm-hmm. okay, 
the three point shot may be your best shot. Yeah. It, it's yeah, you, now you, you, if you, you're if you know, let's say you're Stony Brook, where you have had nights where you hit one for twenty, <laughs> uh, or or right. like Houston, that Villanova beat to get there. They went one for 20. They couldn't hit the ocean from three. There's there's a team that did to a degree, but should have done to a greater degree, said the hell with the three, just right. go for two. Just you know, use your size get there, and play the old-fashioned way. That yep. might have made a difference. And now, yeah, Villanova think... wasn't that great shooting either, but they got timely threes. Yes, they, yeah, they made some baskets when they needed to. I think the way that the game shook out for Kansas with the win um, plays in their favor because I think the, the Duke-North Carolina game was such a good game, uh, and they both had to expend such energy, and it was down to the wire for the win. I think for Kansas, I think it's a real, real benefit for them because I think they should be fresher going into the game on on um, on, on Sunday. Oh, excuse me, tomorrow night. I Monday. think they're going to expose North Carolina for what they are. An eight seed. <laughs> yeah, they they could. I mean, they really Kansas could. impressed us against Stony Brook. Yeah, that's another friendly reminder. Yes, we did play them earlier this year. Uh, but the uh, yes, I, I liked the way they they played end to end against Villanova, and I. I just think they are the best team, or you know, the better of the two teams that have survived. But that was, you know, haymaker after haymaker. It was another toe to toe game that, you know, defined the rivalry, definitely. And two teams that knew each other extremely well. And, uh, you know, Duke just ran out of ammunition. And that's pretty much what, excuse me, Shashevsky said. Uh, that Shashevsky said, uh, you know, I still like that line. They, they, what happened was, I was listening on the radio on the way back from Bridgeport last night to the post-game press conference and hearing uh, Krzyzewski say that, you know, you you either want a locker room full of tears of sorrow or a locker room full of tears of joy. And the reason why you want that is because in either case, you know you left it out there. There's nothing more you could have done. Yeah, I, I did. I thought that was a good line as well, too. I think, and and, and just for him, because they they go to the tournament so often, they've been so successful. Um, and you know, basketball is so different than a lot of other sports because there's such, you know, you, you're looking. What are you, twelve, twelve guys, fifteen players on your team, right? So you really are connected with your basketball team more than other teams because the team is so small. Yep. Small uh, locker room, small everything. Yeah. yeah everything yep. is small, smaller scale. Yep. Except for the players. They're just as tall as can be. Yeah, <laughs> right? exactly. But the, they are, um, you know, there's, they do everything together, you know, from, so I think that that is, and it's such like a, an end when it's over, it's over, you know, and when you know it's over, you know, it's over, and then you add in, and, you know, Coach K not, you know, this is going to be his final season as well, too. I think that was a, a tough burden for those players to have to play with. You know, have to play with that idea that, you know, they're the, um, they're going to try and continue the legacy yeah. of Coach K. They want him to go out like Wooden did. Wooden's yeah. last game, he won, he won the national championship in 1975. There's a very famous picture of him with the net around his neck. Right, I just don't see how. Um, it's just that's just not how it works. You just don't get to be. Um, you just don't get to be John Elway. Yeah, you don't get to go out on top. Yeah, it's it, it's not you know it's not normal. Well, the really ironic thing about John Elway is because he was the guy who couldn't win the big game, and he wins the last two years on top. Yeah, and ironically with that, too, remember he was going to be the guy after he won the first one. Everybody was saying, well, he's definitely not coming back because, you know, why would you come back? He won the big one. Now he yeah. doesn't have to, you know, he doesn't have to be like, you know, on the the old, the, the only player not to win a, a championship list, right? Or one of the players, the best player not to win a championship yeah. list. Yeah. Peyton Manning, same problem. Couldn't win the big one. Yeah. He goes to Denver and win. <laughs> 
Yeah, right. But any, any, I just thought, uh, two, I really, I thought two mistakes for, for Duke that hurt them, uh, was, uh, who was the player that got four fouls in the first half? Um, for Duke, I thought that was a mistake having him in the game with three foul, fouls going going to the uh, to the stretch there. Uh trying to I'm gonna call up the box score. Yeah, if I can. So anyway, I thought him that was a big. I think as well too. Okay, now that do well, you know what? The, uh, Duke's John. own website would have all the the real breakdown. Okay, go duke.com in case you you want to follow along with us. So anyway, it was it was Theo John who picks up his fourth foul. Okay, uh, in the first half, and so anyway, he's one of their bigs, and. Um, he gets um, three of his four fouls within a three-minute stretch right before halftime. Uh, and I think that made it much more difficult for them. Uh, I was, I did question why he was still in the game after he picked up his third foul uh, at that point in time. I thought that hurt them um, to begin with. Yeah, because mid's down to 14. Yeah, I mean, and, and that's... It was with six points. Different. I thought, yeah, and I thought that gave... Um, Baycott more opportunity to roam. Uh, gave Mack a little more opportunity to roam as well too, uh, and to play a little bit. Although he didn't, I didn't think Mack didn't play particularly well for UNC, but he did hit a couple big three pointers uh, in the second half. Well, I mean, again, looking at the, the then. By the way, hot tip, folks: if you really want the best box score you can find, go to that school's website. Athletics website because they've got the official, uh, the official stat broadcast or whatever they use. But uh, taking a look at this right now, just a second because in the first half, okay, I'm looking at UNC's. Well, neither team shot well from three. Duke went two for twelve, and Carolina went three for thirteen. But the second half, North Carolina went seven for thirteen, and Duke went three for ten. So Duke finished at five for twenty-two. That's not, not going to win you anything. No. And it was a. Uh, I mean, I don't know, it's tough to say it wasn't. I mean, I thought I just thought it was a oh, it was a great game in that regard. It was. I mean, it was great in the fact that it was just you know eighty-one to seventy-seven on the way down. There there were points in the game where it was kind of like a there was kind of some ugly play going on there, but I, I do think it was a, a really good uh, final four game. And I just felt like Duke just at the end of the game just ran out of answers. Mm-hmm. And I do feel like the last shot that they took probably could have been, uh, they probably could have worked it for a little bit better of an opportunity. I felt like they shot it a little prematurely. You know, I, I would like to have seen them uh, set something up so that they can get somebody off the screen for maybe an open look um, for a shot. But, I mean, they didn't have any timeouts either at mm-hmm. that point in time. And that was the other point that I thought was, um, you, know, you don't, you know, not having a timeout at that moment hurt them as well, too. Yeah, but I'm just looking at the numbers here. And, you know, you, you see the game and you see the numbers and you see how they break down. It is very interesting to see, uh, you know, see starters like Jeremy Roach go for five from three and two for eleven from the floor. Yeah, that, that obviously you, you attribute to defense, but still, in a national semifinal, you know, you see some guys that just didn't have such great games. Paolo Banchero won eight for seventeen, but but there you go. I mean, same thing happened in the other game. And you're going to see a lot more of it tomorrow night, of course. But here's another little thing. And I was thinking about this. And I had to look it up for the story to find out what, why this was the case. Why, for example, you know, the NCAA takes in a little over a billion dollars a year, like 1.2, 1.3. And 
ninety percent of that comes from the tournament, the NCAA, the men's basketball NCAA tournament, and the bulk of that is from the rights fees being paid by, you know, the rights holders to the broadcasts, which would be CBS and Turner Sports. Everybody's thinking that's all CBS. It is not. Especially these last two deals that were made. CBS couldn't afford to do it on their own, and Turner Sports kicked in half the money. A little bit more than half, actually. So the net result is the reason why you're seeing all these games on TBS is because the CBS and TBS are alternating coverage. So this is TBS's year to get the Final Four. CBS will have it next year. Okay. I was wondering why it was on TBS. That's the uh, reason. Last night. Okay. But, yeah, that was the... Uh... Yeah. And I put up a little Facebook note saying, which should I rather watch? The Grammys or the Women's National Championship game? Yeah, right. Um, so you're... Uh... Are we going to do maybe predictions for uh, tomorrow night's game? Might as well. I mean, I've already kind of, kind of cast my lot with Kansas, and I think maybe you have too because yeah. their game seems to be a bit more complete. I would agree with that. I, I do like the way Kansas plays. Uh, I was wondering if it could be – it's hard to say this because he did – Play at Carolina and played in the NBA, but I was wondering if um, could could tomorrow night be too much for for Hubert Davis in the fact that first time first time in the national championship. Although I didn't see that at all from him last night, I thought he coached an excellent game last night um, for UNC. Just Bill Self just having an opportunity to have been there before um, is it too you know? Yeah, but when was the last time Kansas won? Well. Okay, I just want to look at Bill Self's year by year coaching record here. Because, okay. You know what? I was uh, surprised. I couldn't get over that three coaches had went to the national championship in their first year. Okay, coaching. I'm looking at this and hold on. National champion. Uh, no. He hasn't won either. Oh, here it is. Oh, seven, oh, eight. There we go. That's it. So they haven't won 14 years themselves. Yeah. Well, you see the coach? He was the coach at the time, yeah. Yeah. He I took just, over in 03, 04. I was just wondering if that was, if that, I think that would be a, an edge to Kansas. I think the the, the emotional game between uh, Duke and UNC plays that's an advantage for Kansas. Um, although Grant Hill had a really interesting point uh, post game as I was watching as well too, where he said when he when they beat UNLV when he was at Duke. So after they beat UNLV when he's at Duke, uh, Coach K kicked them out of practice the next day. And then brought them back into practice, you know, 30 minutes later, an hour later, whatever it was, because he wanted to refocus them and remind them that they, they you know, they still have the, uh, one, one more game to play, to play in. Like UNLV wasn't the only game that they had to play. And I was, I thought that would be an interesting tact for, for UNC as well, too, right? You, you just play this game. That's this unbelievably exciting game. Everybody's damned about it. You've been talking about it all week long. It really was it really overshadowed the Villanova Kansas game, in my opinion. Just uh, it was going and, to no matter what. Yeah, and I have a friend that lives in Carolina, and he told me it, it was <laughs> it was just like wild. It must be what it would be like. He said it must be like the week before uh, Auburn Alabama in football. You know, with sides yeah. are being drawn up here. You know, it was, it was that kind of it had that kind of atmosphere to it. Yep. So can can the kids jump back two days later and be focused to play Kansas? I think they can. Mainly okay. because North Carolina is a mature program. They, are, I mean, they know, and of course, 
you know, yes, the rivalries within the ACC and go to hell Carolina and all the other stuff from Duke. Yes, it, th- those those matter. And they've already done their job as far as Duke is concerned because in Shevsky's last game at Cameron Indoor Stadium, they destroyed him. And then they did it again in the Final Four. I don't think there's a letdown here. I, I think they, they know what they're dealing with here, and they think they do still have their eyes on the prize. And in, in a way, yes, it could be you know, annoying to an extent, that they have to deal with all this Duke hype because of what's you know what's at stake, but the you know I I think they're mature enough to know that there's another game left to be played. Yeah, and Duke UNLV. Remember the first time they met in the national championship game, UNLV blew them out by thirty points. That was in nineteen ninety, I believe. Right. So that that was a bit of a revenge factor there. I don't think that's necessarily the same in this case. I mean, it's not like, you know, Duke had one side dominance over North Carolina over the years. It's been anything but. It's been back and forth all along. So, you know, just another game in the schedule. Move on. Yeah, I think that's a really quality. I think that's a really good point, man. I think just the, the, kind of like the idea you're putting out there, just that they play a lot of tough t- teams all the time and, and the, the next game thing, is going to be a game game as well, it's so. not like a ha- just yeah. happy to be here situation you know your first time in the final four and god knows how long and you're just happy to be there no the, this is not the case you're an eight C. yes you did not get a lot of love from the selection committee you had uh you some people consider an off year but you that's way behind you now seating doesn't matter that's no, you've won five games to get here. So that was a long time ago. Especially from a player's point of view. Five games ago is last year. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it, like a different, a di- completely different era. For the, yeah. <laughs> especially in basketball, because basketball, is, it's got such a, I guess really in all sports, but it's just got a, such a confidence piece to it. There are different teams from the start of the NCAA tournament to the end of the NCAA tournament. Who's hot, who's not, who's playing. So I do agree with you. I think they're going to – I think you're a little bit more thinking that they're going to be exposed just because Kansas is going to be better. Yes. I think that's uh, the, uh, what they're, they're going to be dealing with. I don't necessarily think the emotional letdown after beating Duke is going to work against them. I think the fact that Kansas is better is going to work against them. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that I, – I, hmm. wouldn't you like to see the Villanova game, Villanova-Kansas game? Uh, I should call it the Kansas game, right? The Kansas Villanova game, mm-hmm. um, without the early, the early first half run. Well, let's bring it up. You know, they, I mean, they doubled them up there uh, at one point in time. So I, I, I would, I don't know. I, for me, I got to me, for me, I got Kansas winning because I think it's just your your. Uh, I just think they're going to be worn. Okay, well, I'm going to. Here I we think go. It's going to be worn down here. The box score of Villanova, Kansas, and okay. First of all, the shooting for Villanova in the first half was ten for thirty. They actually, was half the five for fifteen from three is halfway decent, but ten for thirty overall is not. Right. And forty eight percent, fifteen for thirty one for. Uh, for Kansas, there's your difference right there. And 7 for 14 from 3. And they kept it up in the second half. They shot 61% in the second half and 6 for 10 from 3. So that's super consistent. When your 3-point percentage and your overall percentage is the same, that's amazing. That is pretty <laughs> It's pretty impressive. Wow, think about that for a second. I mean, Ochai Agbaji, he shot 6 for 7 from 3. Dewan Harris, three for five from three. Okay. So, I mean, that, and Villanova is a good three point shooting team. Even Gillespie shot five for eight, and Brandon Slater, four for seven. Everybody else is a little bit of a drop off. They did get better in the second half, Villanova. You know, they, they hit eight for 16 from three. So, that's one of the reasons why they were able to, you know, for the game didn't become a blowout. But, 
because there was only a five point differential, but they were down eleven at the half and never made up for it. Right. Yeah, they just couldn't chip away at that. Exactly. But the other fact that you get out rebounded twenty five to seventeen doesn't help either. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think you're right in your argument um, that I mean we're both going. We both think Kansas is going to win, but I do think you're right in your argument. The fact that um, they're just going to we both agree Kansas is going to win. We do for different reasons, but I do understand your point of saying um, they're just going to outclass them, and I think they really could. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, so- but that doesn't that doesn't mean I'm not going to watch. <laughs> Well, yeah. I mean, that's why you do watch. And now, the funny thing about it is that neither of us has a particular rooting interest. I mean, my father went to Villanova. That's why I was super disappointed with they they, they didn't win. And, you know, I wear his Villanova hoodie all the time and stuff like that. So, you know, then this would have been, if they got into the national championship game, sadly enough, would have been the first national championship game I will have watched without him because we won, we watched the first three together. But uh, but even one well, back at eighty five, but the, uh, the the yeah, but still Villanova will be back, and you know Jay Wright is still one of the greatest coaches in NCAA history, and you know he's gonna you know someday when he retires he's gonna have the same send off like uh, Shevsky had, maybe he you know, won't win twelve hundred games, but you know he's still you know one of the best uh, he, he has one of the best programs in the Northeast, so that means a lot, and also. Yeah. You know, puts Villanova back on the map as a major power. But the other thing that, you know, the longer legacy of Jay Wright is that I remember Dick Laskowski. You remember Dick. Yeah, mm-hmm. Ski. Uh, everybody owns St. John's, used to call him Ski. But uh, he once said to, I mean, Kurt Hilton and I were once talking to him, and he said, watch what happens with the Big East. The Big East is, because of the football, the Big East is going to split up. Where the basketball school is going to go one way and the football school is going to go another way. Happened exactly as he predicted it. And the big question at that time was and we discussed this on sports sections and stuff like that. You know, would whatever the Big East became, and the Catholic schools kept the Big East name because they historically they re- referred to the Big East as pre breakup and post breakup. That the Big East, yeah. the, the post breakup Big East, is considered a different conference. But those Catholic schools, Villanova, St. John's, Providence, and so forth, okay, they didn't miss a beat. If anything, the schools that left suffered. UConn ran into trouble. I mean, UConn women didn't. They, they, they'd beat anybody. UConn men certainly did. They go into the American, you know, for for football's sake, and they got back to the Big East as soon as they could. Look at Syracuse, first losing season under Bayheim ever. BC, when their football team didn't win a game one year, their basketball team was almost as bad. BC went in the tank. You know, where, where's Pitt these days? You know, where Notre Dame, I think, has been okay, but Notre Dame's going to be okay no matter what they do because they're still a de facto independent. They they yeah. do they march their own drum no matter what conference they're in. They don't care. Uh, but you look at a Virginia Tech, and, you, and look, West Virginia, all these schools that were part of the, that Big East Conference and had seen some success – particularly men's basketball, going to the NCAA tournament, getting in the polls, where are they? Well, you, you, they took uh, a different brand and style of basketball. The Big East style of basketball is just different. And they're trying to implement the Big East kind of basketball into another uh, into another conference at the ACC, and it just doesn't work. You know, it's just a different, if it's a different animal. And I don't think you can recruit. The ACC is always going to be UNC. It's always going to be Duke. It well, is I shouldn't say, a right, North Carolina-centric right, conference it, geographically. Yeah. I mean, the American East, for example, is a Boston-centered conference. Okay, we're an outlier. Okay, the Colonial Athletic Association is a Washington, D.C.-centered conference. Yeah. 
Okay, most of the schools are within striking distance of D.C., except for us, except for Hostra. Okay, we're an outlier either way, which is why I've been saying for, you know, even said last week that my dream would be to have all the local schools, you know, forget about the Mac Iona, know, forget yeah, about yeah. the Northeast Conference Wagner, and to get together and form a New York-centric conference like the Big East, but not necessarily, you know, big-time D1. You know, mid-major, a mid-major conference similar in philosophy to the Big East. But the Big East, on the flip side, wasn't about New York, even though it is kind of New York-centered because of the game, the uh, tournaments at the Garden. Big East is not really New York-centered. It's Northeast media market-centered. Yeah. Boston must have a presence in Boston, must have a presence in Hartford, must have a presence in Providence, must have a presence in New York City, and so on, and but in D.C., and so on and so forth, in, in, you know, all the way up and down. So, you know, Dave Gavitt was thinking about these things when he put the Big East together in Philadelphia, okay, B- putting together this conference because he knew the largest media markets in the country are all in that region, and they all had schools planted in that in those regions. And it worked yeah, brilliantly. I, yeah, it really did. And I, I I think his son won an award last night as well, too, as I was watching the uh, the game. Uh, I can't remember what he he won, but I, I, it was funny. It was, and I thought about him last night as as the because uh, it was going on during the Villanova game as well, too. Um it was really cool uh, to see him to do that where he's jumped into the mix and he is, um, I don't want to say he's following his father's footsteps, but he certainly is. And he kind of won some kind of award last night and they acknowledged him there as well too. So it's kind of like that continuation of the big East, which I thought was cool. Yeah. Um, But I mean, that's what that is. And again, this is someone who's followed the big East since the absolute very beginning because I had siblings in St. John's who were students at the time. So I get season tickets. I get to watch Mullen, got to watch Ewing, and got to watch within you know five years of its foundation, put three teams in the final four. And everybody says the fourth one, should BC should have made it too. But, uh, I mean, to go from, you know, basically slightly above a mid-major to powerhouse in five years is amazing. Because St. I mean St. John's got national attention, but nothing like they did when they got to when when the Big East was put uh, together. Yeah. They like won. They like own the city, and definitely when, not uh, Syracuse. Yeah. Syrac- Jim Beheim, and he'll even say owes his whole career to the Big East, and he'll also say that you know probably he it, it wasn't his fault they went to the ACC. The Big East screwed yeah. up a TV deal, and the and Syracuse followed the money. And he couldn't do anything to stop it. Yeah, and he said that too. Like, completely just came out and said, "Listen, you, you know what this is about. This is about football. This is not about um, this is not about basketball. This is about football and the ability to make money on it." Um, and I think that's going to be, you know, when you, when you you had brought up the NCAA tournament before and how um, you know the Final Four March Madness brings in the the, the most money. You know, we go back to that small team thing as well, too. It's also the sport that you're spending the least amount of money on. Oh, yeah. For the athletes That's as well, why too. So when that pie got big, when, when the, the yeah. rights fees got to a billion dollars, that's why Stony Brook went D1 and so many others yeah. did right around that same time 20 plus years ago. They but wanted with, a piece with, of the pie. Yeah. And, and, and just by your. Now, how does it break down for. Um, when you make the when you make the tournament, so does the conference get a piece and then the team get a bigger piece? I think so. Like, well, say, the like team when, definitely gets the conference gets a piece it, no matter what, and the team gets a piece right. by by making it. So yeah, and that's why everybody's competing for it. That's why it's such a big deal. And I don't know exactly what the size of the piece is. You have to look it up. But you remember, it's a big pie, right? And that's but the, in every in every sport, right? In every sport, there's a, you, you make it in, and your 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 athletic department is getting a piece of the pie. Exactly, right for that. Mm-hmm. 